Okay, welcome to the lecture, Introduction to Behavioral Science for Research Methods. Uh, this lecture originally was titled Basics of Experimentation, uh, but I decided to retitle the lecture and kind of refocus it a bit um, to give you uh, a broader context of what we'll, we'll, what we'll be doing, uh, so some more background information before we get focused more on experimental methodology in particular. Uh, I think that's important in order for you to uh, be aware of why we're learning what we're going to be learning. So, starting off, uh, what is behavioral science? Uh, well, if we break that down, we're going to start thinking about what is science. Uh, well, the root word uh, in Latin for science is scio, which means to know or to understand. So, science is a path to knowing or understanding, and it's also the knowledge uh, or understanding that's generated by taking that path. Uh, so really we have two things when it comes to science. We have the scientific, scientific method and scientific knowledge, and scientific knowledge is generated obviously by uh, pursuing and use, making use of the scientific method. Uh, in this course, we're going to focus primarily on uh, the former of those, uh, on the scientific method as a way of acquiring knowledge. Uh, but before we talk about the scientific path or method, uh, let's look at some other methods uh, of knowing. Uh, so other paths include intuition, uh, so relying on a subjective sense of what feels right. Um, so an example might include uh, artists, you know, um, Picasso gives or gave his view of uh, the world knowledge through through painting. Um, and sometimes whenever you need to make a decision about uh, doing a particular thing, uh, you don't rely on um, uh, research articles or asking of people, you just kind of think about, okay, well what do I think is right, what feels right to me, and you make a decision. So that is one source uh, of knowledge. Uh, another, one of the uh, old sources uh, of knowledge would be reliance on authority. This is kind of the belief that the world's mysteries are knowable through the visions and interpretations of accepted uh, authorities. Uh, an easy example that comes to mind might be uh, in theology. You know, theologians as authorities on faith and religious teachings uh, might clarify one aspect or facet of um, doctrinal knowledge. And now, uh, authority has, uh, it seems to me, become the internet. So when you want to know something, you look it up on Wikipedia, right? And that is the authority. And you rely on it to give you accurate information. Uh, another path might be rationalism. Uh, and this originally is based on the assumption that all knowledge is innate. So we're all born knowing things, and you must uh, discover this knowledge uh, via logical thought. Uh, so through rational or logical thought, through reasoning, you can discover knowledge. Uh, examples of this would be things like in geometry, doing proofs, or those uh, things you might remember from uh, tests in high school, you know, if Anna is taller than ben, than ben, and Ben is taller than Charles, therefore Anna is taller than Charles. That would be kind of a way to discover the relationship between Anna and Charles based on uh, applying logic to some uh, accepted um, uh, principles. <coughs> Excuse me. Another path to knowledge, uh, empiricism. And now, empiricism is a bit of a reaction to rationalism, and it rejected um, intuition as a source of knowledge. So the idea being that we're not born knowing things, um, and replaced it with personal observation and experience. So you can only know things uh, by observing them directly. So if you want to know, is it raining? If you took an empirical approach, you would stick your head out the window and, and see if you got wet. Um, Okay, so all four of these approaches are used to, uh, to some extent, to advance scientific knowledge uh, in different ways. Um, okay, so the scientific method uh, incorporates bits of uh, the other paths, um, uh, but in a kind of a systematic way. And uh, kind of a general overview of the scientific method. We start off with some observation. You observe some behavior in the world that catches your attention. Right? And, and it catching your attention may be due to some sort of uh, intuition that you feel like this might be uh, important. Um, and you're going to determine what existing theories of, uh, of human behavior exist that would account for the behavior you're interested in, which means consulting authorities, right? although these authorities get their authority, hopefully, from uh, empiricism. Uh, and then you're going to decide whether or not you think that theory uh, is adequate. Uh, and you'll derive a hypothesis from that theory um, that can either uh, 
support or fail to support um, that theory. Um, and then you, you test the hypothesis, so you generate and analyze uh, data, you generate data by you know conducting an experiment, and you analyze and make sense of it, um, and you determine whether or not it did indeed support, uh, your results supported or failed to support the theory. Uh, and then you revise the theory, and you can start uh, all over again, derive a new hypothesis from the revised theory. Okay, uh, I wasn't quite right the first time the data suggested that what there wasn't a good fit, if I change the theory slightly, now my hypothesis would say this is going to happen. You don't just say, okay, well that's what happened in the last study, therefore now this theory is right. It happened once, but may have been a may have been a fluke. So now we derive um, a new hypothesis from this revised theory, and we test it again. And in this way, we can build um, scientific knowledge. Okay, so that was a general overview of the scientific method. Now let's talk uh, in a little more detail about the the scientific method. So as we said before, you start with some observation. You know, you notice something in the world, and you begin to wonder if it might be true in more than the instance or instances that you noticed it. Right, so this is very much consistent with uh, empiricism, right? So you're observing things to be true, uh, but you don't stop. Empiricism would say you stop there. Okay, I saw it, therefore it's true. Scientific method says, okay, well that that's a maybe. You know, it was true that time, but really we're, we're interested in more kind of generalizing from one instance to others. Is that generally true? For whom is it true? When is it true? Um, and so you use some in inductive reasoning to try to um, think about. Uh, whether or not this instance is true uh, in other instances. Uh, an example might be, let's say you live in an apartment complex and the couple in the apartment next to yours, you know, they argue a lot. And you notice that they seem to fight more frequently and more loudly uh, in the week right before a major holiday. You know, this might be true uh, for other couples. So from here, you begin to develop a research question. Uh, so I'm beginning to wonder, okay, you know, maybe... Um, disagreements about the holidays is related to a couple conflicts somehow. So when you have an idea for your research question, the first thing you do is you review the literature. So you're looking uh, to, to identify what the context of your question is and also to better refine your question. You know, in, in behavioral science and in most science, we don't start from scratch. You don't say, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to go look at this. First you see what's been done before. Science is very additive in nature. You build on what's been shown before. That doesn't mean that you have to accept what's been shown before as true, but you need to look at you know, what data exists already in terms of, okay, people have found that this was true in this study. If it's true in several studies, then you're fairly confident that it's probably true a lot of the time. Um, so when you're thinking about your research question, you're going to be trying to support uh, previous research or contradict it, but you're not going to ignore previous research on your topic. Uh, if you ignore it, then we won't make progress. People will be going in all different directions, and science will never move forward. Um, at this point, it's a good idea to look for existing theories that would help explain uh, your observation, uh, because advancing theoretical knowledge will move science um, forward much more quickly than just doing kind of this piecemeal, here's one little hypothesis, oh, here's another one, and not uh, um, relating them to any kind of systematic theory that connects ideas. Okay, the, the question... Uh, there's the literature view, sorry. Uh, your research question is going to be about the relationship between uh, or among variables. <coughs> so that leads us to uh, a brief uh, sidebar of what's a variable, right? So a variable is anything that can take on different values as opposed to a constant which um, cannot change the values, has one value. So uh, temperature is a variable, right? Temperature can be 25 degrees, 30 degrees, 0 degrees, 1,000 degrees, whatever. But temperature at which water boils at sea level is a constant. Right? So there's a difference there. So temperature in general can change. The temperature of something right now you know, isn't a, a variable. That's a, a constant. Um, hair color is a variable. right? And you would say, oh, but I, I don't dye my hair. It's only one color. True, but I didn't say your hair color is a variable. Hair color is a variable because hair can come in different colors. Um, so a lot of the questions you have about uh, relationships between variables will be about cause and effect, but this won't always be true. It depends on the goal of your particular research, and we'll talk a little bit about the different goals uh, of research. Okay, moving forward. Uh, so you've developed a research question, you've consulted the literature, you've got s some sort of relationship between two variables, either cause and effect or 
just kind of association. Oh, the more of one, the more or less of another. Uh, and now you've got to develop hypothesis, you know, about which one causes which, uh, which direction the relationship occurs. Um, so this is a kind of a tentative explanation for your observation. Uh, so uh, for the, the couple example, you know, maybe they fight more before holidays because they, and other couples, argue about uh, how or where to spend the holidays. Right? That's one hypothesis. From that same observation, I could have made some other hypothesis that, oh, well, uh, leading up to the holidays is a stressful time uh, due to um, the financial burden of buying presents, and they're arguing about money. Right? That'd be a different hypothesis. And I don't know which one is, if one is more valid or the other, you know, from the beginning, i got to look at the research and see what people say, and then go and test it to find out. Anyway, so I come up with a hypothesis. And then, from there, I generate a testable prediction based on the hypothesis. This is basically what you think, okay, well, if my hypothesis was true, what would I observe in some particular situation? An example for this might be, um, you know, well, if I'm right that they're, uh, they're arguing about how and where to spend the holidays, and so this pattern is going to uh, reoccur right before the holidays, then uh, the number of 911 calls regarding partner violence will be higher in the week before a major holiday than the week following a major holiday. So notice that's an okay prediction, right? And it's based on deductive reasoning. But of the two hypotheses I mentioned already, one, they're fighting about where to spend the holidays, and the other, they're fighting about money. If, I, if my prediction is correct, like number of 911 calls for partner violence goes up right before the holidays, both of those hypotheses would be supported by those data. Right? So not the best uh, test of my hypothesis, my specific hypothesis, because I, I didn't rule out this other one. So I might want to look at something else, like, well, um, if I give couples um, uh, an intervention that targets on how to talk about um, uh, where you're going to spend the holidays, problem solving around that, uh, will they have less conflict than couples that get some other general communication training not focused on that particular issue? then I might have a, a, a kind of a tighter hypothesis, a better test of exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, okay, so whatever prediction you come up with uh, should have a couple things. should be logical, right? So uh, usually there's kind of these if-then statements. Well, if this happens, then this should happen. So those should be logically related. Should make, should have, it should make sense. Uh, it should be testable. So you, and to be testable, a couple things to that. One of the key things is you have to be able to measure all the variables you're interested in. Um, for example, you know, if somebody says, well, I think if your chakras are aligned, you're going to have good health. You know, that may be true. You know, and we can measure good health uh, fairly well, but there really isn't an objective measure of chakra alignment. Right? It's not one that's agreed upon by uh, Western science. So that probably wouldn't be a testable prediction. Uh, related to testability is falsifiability, so it must be possible to show that you are wrong. Uh, an example of something that's not falsifiable, you know, if I said, well, uh, people can heal their own wounds if they concentrate hard enough. And I'm going to test this by having people concentrate and see if their wounds heal. But that's not falsifiable because if they don't heal, then I could just say, well, they clearly didn't concentrate hard enough. So it's impossible to disprove that. So I always want to have something that could be realistically disproved or falsified. Um, the, the last one, and this one's uh, one people don't think about too often, it should be positive in, in terms of, you've got to state uh, your prediction in terms of the presence of a relationship between variables, not the absence of one. Uh, and this is largely because of the way we test hypotheses, using Null Hypothesis Statistical Testing, NHST, which we'll talk more about in the future. Um, and the, the gist of this is we go in with the assumption uh, that there is no relationship, and then calculate the probability that this lack of relationship is true. <laughs> If it's highly unlikely that there's not a relationship between two variables, then we conclude that there probably is a relationship between those two variables, which I know it takes a bit of mental gymnastics to follow that, uh, and it may not be the best way to, to uh, test relationships, but that's what we have right now. So when we want to, we usually want to prove there's a relationship, and we go in, statistically speaking, saying, okay, let's say there's not, how likely is it that we'd find our data if there weren't a relationship, and if it's a low probability, then we say, okay, then they are related. Um, so generally, if you really do believe that two variables are not related, you typically need to identify a third variable that is related to one of the other two. So if you think, um, you know, uh, watching TV is not related to tax scores, right? uh, you would design a study looking at some other predictor of tax scores, uh, maybe study time, and then you would conduct a study uh, that 
might be able to show that um, study time is a better predictor of tax scores than watching TV. Right? You can't just say, okay, I think these, these things are unrelated, and you do a study and say, look, I found that TV time was unrelated to tax scores. Doesn't mean they're not related, it just means you didn't find it. Okay. Um, okay, so you've, you've made some observations, uh, you've looked at the literature, you come up with a hypothesis about the relationship between variables, you make a prediction about exactly what you think that relationship is, and it has certain characteristics. Uh, and then you engage in a systematic test of your prediction. Um, now this is where the research methods uh, are applied. You know, and the, the key here is really having a systematic method that tries to eliminate bias uh, or kind of chaos or randomness from contaminating your your test, so that you can be uh, as confident as possible in the answer you get by collecting uh, data. I mean, if you design kind of a crappy study, you get some data that supports your prediction. People say, eh, but your study was crappy. Well, that's not any fun. Nobody's going to like you want to play through the sandbox. So you wanted to have rigorous methodology uh, that is systematic um, and eliminates kind of, uh, like I said, bias and, and chaos. So uh, one good place to start is defining uh, and deciding how to measure your variables. So you come up with operational definitions of your variables. Because um, usually in behavioral science, we're interested in, in constructs, right? things like depression or aggression or creativity. I and mean, you can't, like, hey, show me your creativity, show me your aggression. These, are, these aren't things, tangible things you can touch, right? These are ideas, these are constructs, um, things that you can't really simply observe directly. Uh, you can measure, you know, some marker that you think indicates the presence or absence of that construct, uh, and that's what, you know, we try to do. So, but first you have to kind of define what you think that construct means, because people will disagree uh, about exactly what a construct means, and if, if, you, if you can be clear about what you think it means, people know, you know what you're talking about. Um, so, for example, let's think about uh, aggression. A lot of different thoughts about what constitutes aggression. Maybe you want to operationalize it as um, you know, physical contact during an interpersonal dispute. Reasonable. Not necessarily the truth, but that's one operational definition. Other people would include probably uh, verbal aggression in there, too. Um, other ways of being aggressive that don't involve physical contact, intimidation, but that certainly is a potentially valid operational definition. So once you have your operational definition, you still need to come up with a way of measuring this. And there are uh, a multitude of ways to measure uh, this operational definition of, of aggression. Uh, one, if you have people uh, you know, interacting and they were having some sort of interpersonal dispute, you could videotape the interactions and then have judges determine the presence or absence of aggression. Right? So they would rate okay, the, this person touched this person this many times, whatever. Uh, you get people to self-report. Um, you know, in the past week, how many times when you were in an argument uh, with someone else did you uh, touch them? Or did you hit them or slap them or however you want to, to ask that question? You know, get creative. You could, uh, you know, have uh, you know, subjects come in and uh, put some paint on their hands, uh, have them get an argument, and then... Um, count the number of paint splotches on somebody else's clothes from somebody else's hands. Uh, anyway, the, the point is, there are lots of ways to measure variables, and we'll get into more details about the best way to measure uh, variables later, but just know that is one kind of the key steps uh, in your, your, your testing and predictions. Uh, then you're going to need to pick who's going to be in the study, you know, the participants or, or research subjects. Usually we're interested in some population, right? And sometimes this population is people, right? We often think of population from referring to people, all people everywhere. But usually uh, the population that we're, that we're interested in is more specific. It might be military personnel or school teachers or adolescents or immigrant, immigrants from Angola. Uh, uh, but you need to identify you know, what that population is you're interested in that your study is going to be about. And then realistically, uh, you probably can't get the whole population to participate in your study. So you're going to have to get a sample, some portion of that population. And we'll talk in the future about uh, some characteristics of the sample. But some things to think about for now is that uh, when getting your sample, uh, you may want to restrict who can be in your sample. You know, if you think certain types of people will make it difficult to answer your question, you know, because they have kind of other things going on not related to your research question, but it would kind of make your data messy, then you would use uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria says that you have to have certain things to be selected into my sample, and exclusion criteria say 
um, if you have these things, you will be eliminated from the sample. Um, so you define measure variables, you select your participants, and then you choose a research strategy. And the, the first kind of major decision point here is qualitative versus quantitative research. Uh, with qualitative research, it's generally about making observations about the quality or nature of a phenomenon um, and then reporting those observations. Uh, and with quantitative research, you're using numerical values to indicate the level of, uh, of your variables and then applying statistical analyses um, to those numbers. Uh, and in this class, I want your uh, research proposal to be uh, a quantitative study. So measuring variables uh, with numbers and using stats to, to look at that. Um, so for that reason, let's talk a little bit more about um, quantitative research strategies in particular. Um, basic breakdown, uh, descriptive research. And this is just how much of a variable exists within some group. You know, so you know, what's the average amount of time that uh, kids spend texting? You know, if you do a study looking at that, that would be a descriptive study. You know, and an, an important question and um, a good starting point for other research possibly. Uh, and then correlational research would be another type. This is when are two or more variables related in a predictable way. Um, so maybe I, I want to know, um, you know, do kids who uh, text more um, get higher or lower grades? Right? And I'm not necessarily um, hypothesizing a cause-effect relationship here. I'm just wondering, you know, are they related? Because it could be one causes the uh, A causes B or B causes A. I don't know. I just want to know, are they related? That would be a correlational study. If, however, I did think there was a cause-effect relationship, then I would conduct an experiment. Right? I would manipulate one variable, the independent variable, to see if it caused changes in another variable, the dependent variable. So with the texting grades one, I would have to take uh, a bunch of kids, some text, some don't, and I randomly assign half of them to, to one group and half to the other group with hopefully equal numbers of textures and non-textures in each group, and then I would, you know, force <laughs> one group to text and force the other group not to text and then see what happens to their grades. That would be uh, an experimental method. Uh, and then the, the fourth type would be a quasi-experimental. This is when you want to look at causality, but you can't for some reason. Usually that reason is you can't manipulate the independent variable. And this frequently occurs when you have uh, the kind of the independent variable you're looking at uh, is related to some existing group. So if I'm look, I want to look at uh, you know the effects of uh, biological sex, right? So difference between men and women. Well, you can't assign people to be male or female. Um, so in studies like that, that's really quasi-experimental, not truly experimental. Uh, and for for this uh, for this course for your research proposal, I want your study to be um, preferably experimental, but it's okay if you do quasi-experimental, but uh, not correlational or descriptive. Okay, so you pick a research strategy, and then you get down to your research design. And this is where you, where you really get down to some specifics, kind of nuts and bolts stuff. We'll talk more about when we talk about different uh, different types of uh, research strategies. But some things that you might be thinking about, you know, will participants know if they're getting an active treatment or a placebo? Uh, will all participants experience the same things in the same order? Um, things like that. Uh, and then, after you've done <laughs> all this hard work you finally get to uh, conduct your study and uh, generate some data. And then you'll analyze your data with uh, probably a computer software program and you'll compare your data, your results, to your prediction and to your hypothesis. So did you support or contradict your hypothesis? Um, and then you kind of go back to what we talked about before about um, you refine your hypothesis and or the theory it was derived from and you go back and do it again until you kind of are confident that you know what's going on, that you know the answer to the question that you started with. Um, so you have to ask, was the hypothesis or theory supported or not? You know, in either way, you're probably going to tweak some things and have uh, some ideas for the next step in, in research. Uh, and then you don't do this uh, in seclusion. You report your results because that's one of the, the key things about behavioral science is it's it's very public. You know, you don't do your studies your study and then uh, you read it, maybe show up a few friends, you publish it in the public domain and anybody can read it uh, and they can uh, hopefully take your ideas, maybe have some ideas of their own and take it a step further or say, okay, well, you found that this was true about, you know, texting, kids that text 
uh, get higher grades, maybe. And they say, well, I wonder if that's true about uh, kids in um, Abu, Abu Dhabi. I'm going to do a study there. Okay, great. You know, you don't have the resource to do that. So now science can grow, knowledge can grow, based on this kind of sharing of knowledge um, that occurs. Okay, so hopefully now you have uh, a better idea of kind of the research process if you didn't already know all this stuff. Um, in terms of, you know, th this particular path to knowledge that's very um, systematic and has kind of steps that you follow in a certain order. You know, this is knowledge of what? This is behavioral science, so it's knowledge of behavior. So the question is, you know, what is uh, behavior? Um, generally, it's an action of an individual or a group. And in the behavioral science, there's really an emphasis on observable behavior. But a lot of interesting stuff isn't observable. Kind of what we talked about before about constructs. You know, you can observe cigarette smoking behavior, but you can't observe craving. But it's pretty interesting to study craving uh, behavior, if you can call it that. Um, and you can study craving by looking at behavioral indicators of craving. Craving, sorry. Uh, so asking people, you know, how much are you craving a cigarette right now? It'd be self-report. Uh, and then behaviors that are done in response to craving, like actually smoking or uh, eating or chewing gum or whatever it is that people uh, seem to do whenever they are deprived of uh, a cigarette. Uh, but again, uh, largely thanks to kind of the the influence of uh, a movement in the field called behaviorism, there's a big push to make sure that what we're studying is uh, at some level observable and we talk about it at the right level. So if we're talking about um, you know, what predicts love, we need to be able to tie that to some clear behavior that, okay, when we say what predicts a loving relationship, here's what we mean by a loving relationship. Here are the observable behaviors that we mean when we say love. That way, um, people can't just argue and say, well, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's true about love. Well, depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about these exact behaviors and it's been found consistently, you can't really argue about that. But if you leave it at kind of the construct level, then arguments um, uh, will abound and you won't, you won't get anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what can we know or understand about behavior from science? So, this path to, to knowledge of behavior, you know, where can it take us? Uh, well, it really depends on the goals of your particular study. And I like to an acronym that I, l I learned a long time ago, uh, DOOPSI. helps me remember the goals uh, of science. Uh, the first one, to describe, so the most ba basic scientific goal, to describe behavior. Um, but it's, uh, it's scientific description. So, and by scientific, we mean, it, you know, it tries to be objective and free from personal bias. Uh, you know, so if I made a statement, you know, uh, you can't trust a drug addict. That's not very scientific. It's descriptive about behavior, but it's more maybe based on intuition or, or authority. Now, but if I told you 80% of individuals diagnosed with substance dependence acknowledge that they have lied about their substance use, well, that's descriptive of human behavior. And then from that, you may make a decision about whether or not you think you can trust somebody who has a, a de dependence problem. Um, but again, here the goal is describing at a very kind of behavioral level what we know, free from bias. Uh, another goal of science is to understand behavior, and this is uh, quite often about identifying those causal relationships. Why did this happen um, at this time with this person? Uh, you know, why did uh, that guy in Arizona shoot those people uh, at, the, uh, at the grocery store? Uh, why, whenever uh, someone is in need of help, if there's a large crowd, are people less likely, people are less likely to jump in and help. Um, these are the kind of things that behavioral science tries to, to help us understand. Uh, related to that would be the goal of prediction. So if A then B, you know, so if people have these characteristics, do these things, uh, say these things, what can we know about them? So you know, who's going to be a successful grad student? Uh, who's, what couple is uh, likely to uh, be happy in five years versus identifying which couples are likely to be divorced in five years? You know, um, which of these candidates, based on how they answer these questions, is going to be a successful commercial airline pilot? You know, again goals of our behavioral research, being able to predict behavior. And then the, the last one would be control. Uh, and it, control always sounds bad <laughs> when you first say it, but really it's about, you know, just can we influence behavior? And 
there is obviously the potential for n abusing behavioral science to neg to influence behavior, uh, which is what advertisers uh, do. But we can also use it in terms of you know, can we reduce smoking behavior? Can we reduce um, partner violence? You know, by studying behavior, we can maybe learn uh, how to help people behave in ways that are more adaptive uh, and healthy. Um, so behavioral science has the potential to do quite a lot. Uh, you know, if people don't get mired down in their uh, kind of little worlds and small questions, you have the potential to be able to do really great things with behavioral science. So, so a tool that could potentially be used uh, to do a lot of good, which hopefully gets you excited and you're like, wow, that, that's great, Dr. Fellow. Tell me more about behavioral science. Uh, and so I will. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the key features of behavioral science. So um, not necessarily the steps, but just kind of other uh, aspects that are uh, important to really make it uh, objective. Um, well, one is really an assumption, and it's the assumption of order. Uh, the assumption that events in the world are orderly and predictable. Um, so, you know, you heat water to a precise temperature and it boils. You know, if there weren't any patterns to behavior, there wouldn't be any behavioral science. Um, so, uh, an assumption that may or may not always be true, but is kind of foundational and usually glossed over that we assume to be true uh, when, when doing our work. Uh, a re related uh, assumption would be that of determinism, that every event has a cause, uh, and that the antecedents of an event completely explain that event. So, um, you know, the guy in Arizona, that there, if you know, if you can gather enough information, you will be able to explain why he did what he did. Right? So assuming that if all the variables were in place uh, for another person, then they would do the same thing. Right? That's an assumption of uh, science. Uh, another feature, uh, less of an assumption, well, it's still an assumption, uh, would be parsimony. Uh, you may have heard of it referred to as Occam's razor. And this is the idea that you know all else being equal, the simpler of two explanations is the best. Uh, and this isn't that, that oh well the simple the simplest explanation is the best one. It's well, if two explanations have equal explanatory power, so these two th theories fit the data equally well, so they're right the same amount of time, but one is simpler uh, and simpler in terms of has uh, fewer assumptions, um, fewer uh, kind of logical leaps, then you go with the simpler one. That would be the the assumption of, of parsimony. Um, Another one is the idea of uh, the importance of plausible rival hypotheses. So this is when you're looking at you know, at the conclusion of a study. You know, if you're lucky, you're going to conclude that the data supported your hypothesis. Yay! But you need to consider whether or not a plausible rival hypothesis could also account for your findings. This goes coming back to what we talked about before. You want to design your study in such a way to reduce the number of possible plausible rival hypotheses. Um, so what was the one we talked about before about the, the, the couple arguing? Right. If I think it's they're arguing about uh, where to stay, and all I look at is um, that pattern of well, um, is there more arguments, more partner violence uh, before the holidays than after? Well, that that would be consistent with my hypothesis, but there are other kind of plausible explanations for that too that would account for my for that same pattern of data just as well. So I want to design a better study that limits those other kind of um, plausible rival hypotheses. Um, the last feature I want to talk about, excuse me, is replication. Uh, so if you find something, uh, you know, can you find it again, or can someone else find it? Uh, and to be able to do this, you, you publish your method. So you publish your method in enough detail that somebody else can do your exact study, um, which is very different than kind of uh, kind of corporate science where you hide how you do things. In behavioral science and in, in most academic sciences. You say, hey, this is exactly how I did it. Please try it. See if you get the same thing. Um, and part of the reason for that is there's a recognition that the tools of our science are imperfect. You know, um, in one study, we might conclude that there's an effect of A on B, and we might be wrong. So somebody else needs to go and say, okay, well, you found that. I don't really think it's true. Let me see if I can find it. And if they can't, then now somebody else does a third study. And say, okay, well, did they find it? Uh, and after a while, if people continue not finding it, then we think that the first time somebody found it was maybe a fluke, or maybe it's something unique about that sample. And then that's an interesting question. We try to figure out what that is. But if people find something over and over again, then yep, that seems to happen. That's true here. It's true here. It's true with these people. With these people at this time, then we begin to have more confidence in something. Um, 
That's not to say that we prove a hypothesis or theory, uh, because, ironically, we can't ever prove or disprove um, anything in our, our science. Um, we can only support something or fail to support it. Remember, this goes back to kind of how we look at things with statistics. Uh, and there's, it's, um, statistics uses, uh, sorry, we use statistics to help us estimate the probability that something's true about a population from which a sample is drawn. But this probability will never be 1.0, it'll never be 100%. Um, so even if, like, the, something were true in your sample for every single person in your sample, there's always that possibility that, well, there may be somebody in the population who it's not true for. So unless you measure an entire population and document every instance, very kind of a, a, a purely empirical approach, then you can't ever say something is definitely true. Similarly, you can't ever say something is not true just because you didn't find it. Um, if it's not true in your sample, it may still be true in a significant portion of the population. Or it may be that um, your study wasn't very good or you didn't have enough people, insufficient power to detect an effect, which we'll talk more about uh, later. Um, so for these reasons, replication uh, is important. And it's not just, you know, okay, I found something, somebody else looked again and they didn't find it, now we're done, clearly I was wrong. It's more than that, it's multiple studies uh, and a kind of an accumulation of evidence where we decide whether or not a theory or hypothesis is supported or not supported. Okay, summing a few things up. Uh, so behavioral science is a path to acquiring knowledge about behavior. Uh, and here we'll talk mostly about human behavior, but it can also include uh, animal behavior uh, as well. Um, and again, it's a path, not the path. It's one way of uh, gaining knowledge, gaining understanding, uh, but not the only way. Um, it probably is um, not relied on as much uh, as it could be, or in my opinion, uh, should be. Again, what, what is it? Well, it, it's something that has an emphasis on a systematic approach in that lessening the impact of bias on building knowledge. And obviously, it can't eliminate the impact of bias on, on knowledge building because, um, you know, what questions you ask, um, who you put in your sample, um, how you define and measure your variables are all going to be influenced by um, personal cultural biases. So uh, there is bias in science, but uh, science attempts to um, limit the impact of that bias as much as possible and attempts to be uh, as open as possible about how its uh, business is conducted so that uh, bias, if it's there, uh, can be more easily detected uh, by others. Uh, lastly, it's important to realize that um, the knowledge generated uh, by behavioral science can be used to influence decisions, important decisions. Um, and it can't tell you what you should do, uh, but it can kind of give you some advice in terms of, you know, if you want a certain thing, if you have a desirable goal, let's say if you want to quit smoking, behavioral science can, can address that question of how do you quit smoking. It can't tell you um, you should quit smoking, you know, um, you know, if you wanted to live past 60, then they can tell you that, well, yeah, if you want that, then you probably should quit smoking. But uh, it, it can't tell you what your values should be or what choices to make. But it certainly can help inform those choices. Uh, if, you're, um, if you know enough to be able to consume that knowledge um, in a way that it won't just become uh, uh, this kind of blind authority, that, oh, well, there was a study, therefore it must be right. So, right, like I said before, it's, science is open, and you should look at articles and determine for yourself um, if the conclusions that the authors uh, are reaching, the recommendations they're making, are justified given what they did. And hopefully that's something you'll be able to do um, even more expertly at the conclusion of this class. All right, take care.